Well, first, I'd like to uh, just thank Twist for inviting me out here. And um, I have to start by saying the opinions, interpretations, conclusions, and recommendations are of, uh, for me and not necessarily endorsed by the US Army. So now we got through that, we can actually start talking about science. What I'll be talking about is actually a protocol that we started working with in uh, 2015 during the uh, Western African uh, Ebola outbreak. A group from Illumina, um, head by uh, Gary Schroth, came and approached us to try to uh, use the kit that he was working with to see how we could use that uh, actually in the field in Liberia, because we had deployed a, a genomics capability out there, uh, to see if we could do uh, whole genome sequencing using their uh, products. And so what uh, started as the base and now uh, kind of in the future, using um, probes developed by Twist to now capture uh, uh, a ton more targets than I thought was possible uh, when we started out with this. So uh, I'll be talking about first the um, kind of designing NGS protocols for the field, uh, for because all um, uh, my group at the Genomics Center is really uh, what we think about is like, so how do we, that's great we can do this in a lab, but then how do we do this out in uh, different parts, uh, primarily uh, a lot of the work we've been doing in West Africa. I'll give a quick overview of the hybrid capture um, protocol and how we've designed probes in the uh, previously. Talking about the testing of the PanVile probe set, and the thing I'm most excited about is the real world applications of uh, using uh, Twisted's probes. The center has, um, supports a couple of different labs uh, throughout the, the world. Um, some of these have just been through, say, two week trainings. A lot of these have, um, where we actually set up labs at the Institute Pasteur in, uh, in, uh, in, Institute Pasteur in Dakar in Senegal, where we actually physically brought the MySeq out there and auxiliary equipment to set up the lab. We've actually done that uh, last May. As well as the lab in that the Liberian Institute for Biomedical Research in Liberia, where again, we brought uh, MySeq and other equipment out to uh, Liberia during the outbreak to um, be able to process samples in country. So again, the, the focus is being able to do uh, the sequencing uh, in country. We don't want samples being sent back to the US, but uh, be, uh, again, be done in country. <laughs> so kind of a simple uh, like sample to sequence workflow that we see in a lot of these labs will have uh, either a, a live sample or an inactivated sample. Typically, we extract RNA. Obviously, you can extract uh, DNA either uh, as well and uh, generate a library. So this works great when you're working with um, very homogeneous samples, like you know, a cultured virus, uh, cultured bacteria. It uh, gets a little bit more complicated when you start working with clinical samples, where, um, again, if you saw these labs, we have MySeqs deployed, so we're very uh, limited to the amount of uh, sequencing space, so we need to optimize uh, that sequencing space uh, so that we can capture as much of the viral reads as possible. There's kind of two forms of enrichment that we see. You have um, a physical enrichment is stuff you can do that live sample, so it'd be centrifugation, filtering, uh, nuclease treatments. And then you also have molecular enrichment, where you can uh, enrich the RNA, do uh, ribosomal depletion, um, amplicon sequencing, or what I'll be talking about today is uh, hybrid capture. So again, the, the kit that we've uh, started out with is the, um, it, well, it used to be called the uh, TrueSeq RNA Axis. It's now uh, RNA exome. Uh, so it's a kind of on the, the front end here is a uh, RNA um, stranded RNA seq kit. It's something that we really like, uh, especially working with like a negative sense virus like Ebola, where you can, uh, if you're able to pull out both the negative and positive strand, you possibly can infer uh, viral replication by having positive strands being sequenced. Another aspect of it that we like is the fact that you don't actually do any kind of amplification until the adapter is added. So this kind of eliminates some things if you have to do any kind of amplification before uh, the adapter is added. You can, you can introduce a lot of different contaminations. Uh, this is especially important working in some of these labs where we really uh, not all the time have enough space to actually sequence uh, pre or have um, pre and post amplification kind of separated. And then coupling this with uh, non-overlapping dual indexes, as a uh, previous speaker uh, kind of alluded to. And then obviously the switching out the exome capture with uh, your target of choice, in this case, uh, um, viral targets. So there's kind of like two different approaches that we've used, um, calling this one like the RefSeq approach, where basically taking the, the reference sequences, doing one X tiling across, 
Um, and that's where, as our, that was kind of the original Philo, uh, Philovirus uh, panel that um, uh, Gary came and presented to us. So this one's totaling uh, 2,000 uh, probes. During the uh, Zika outbreak in the Americas, again, we um, kind of uh, begged Gary to give us some probes. Uh, so we were able to design um, 265 probes off of 26 strains. That was actually, at the time when we were sequencing, that's how many strains were actually available on GenBank at the time. That is kind of, uh, there's a ton more now on GenBank. Uh, and I just have an example of a virus that we had sequenced in the lab, but which is actually from an African lineage. As you see, the mismatches are uh, colored. So you know, the probes have um, a couple of mismatches, but we're still able to pull out the target. What we actually, when um, kind of the whole uh, possibility of the, the pan-viral kind of um, uh, panel came up, uh, we were kind of like uh, really excited because there was a lot of instances where we kind of wanted to design uh, probes of different uh, viruses, but really the, the cost doing uh, generating those probes through kind of standard synthesis was just way too high. So again, Gary's group designed uh, 600,000 probes off of roughly a, a, over 1,000 uh, RefSeq uh, viral segments. And then what we've uh, kind of as like what we call like the kind of using that as the base of what uh, uh, Twist is calling the pan-viral uh, set. And what we've done uh, adding to that base additional targets. So when we uh, family or genus of interest, capturing all the diversity in that family or genus and kind of adding it, that to the pan-viral set. So we have, because um, most of the time when we go deploy, there's certain viruses that we're looking for. So now we can do whole genome characterization, but then also look for co-infections uh, when we're using these uh, panels. So kind of the first things we need to test was, okay, now we're dealing with 100-fold more probes in that hybridization reaction. And also now we're uh, switching from single-stranded probes to double-stranded probes. So these are some of the things that kind of a um, uh, little hesitant on how this was going to work when we first got it. I guess, spoiler alert, it, it works since I'm here talking. The, the first thing we uh, kind of, because this was right at the tail end of Zika, so what we did was we had a couple of um, a nice control setup. So we use this to kind of compare the Zika panel, which was uh, 865 probes, uh, plus uh, around 1,500 human probes, which we use kind of as a uh, internal control. So uh, say your sample doesn't have virus in it, but you still have human reads, you still end up pulling that out at the end, so you know that your enrichment reaction actually worked. So you're not just left with no reads at the end. And we're comparing this to the pan-viral probe set that has Again, over 600,000 probes that do include the 865 Zika as well as the, those human probes. The way we set up this uh, design, we did uh, kind of four different treatments with 10,000 reactions, or sorry, 10,000 viral copies per reaction uh, down to uh, 10 viral copies per reaction and spiked those into 20 nanograms of uh, control RNA, which basically just was human RNA. Uh, so first, let's talk about the, uh, how we do the analysis before uh, getting to some of the data. So, you have the total reads, remove the duplicates, because uh, the, the way we're doing it, uh, because we're looking for actually relatively small genomes compared to uh, exomes, our rate of duplication is uh, uh, significantly higher. Then binning the reads, uh, based between the control, unmapped, and virus. And then this uh, final step where we uh, kind of do another kind of a reference-based duplication using Picard tools. Um, I actually think we're going to be able to uh, kind of replace this step now using um, uh, IDT came out with uh, non-overlapping dual indexes that have a UMI. So I think they'll because right this is a very how we're doing this right now is very conservative. We're kind of throwing out a lot of reads that um, might not actually be duplicates. So we have the probes just have or have the indexes haven't started uh, using them quite yet, but really excited about that. So uh, first, just looking at similar levels of duplication, uh, about uh, 75 to 80 percent of the reads are uh, duplicate. Uh, once you look at the non-duplicate uh, reads, uh, we're seeing similar levels, and sorry, I didn't really go in. So the, the top bar here is going to be the, the Zika-specific uh, pro panel and then the pan-viral. And if we uh, kind of break that out, uh, again, we're seeing kind of actually like almost tenfold decreases in the amount of viral reads we're seeing as the um, copies go down. So uh, what does this actually mean and what we're more interested in is really coverage. So you see in the, and sorry if it's tough to read, again, the, the Zika-specific probes are on top and the pan-virals on the bottom. So at uh, 10 to the fourth and 10 to the third, so that's 10,000 copies in the reaction and, or um, 1,000 copies in the reaction, we're seeing 100% coverage. 
when you get down to 100 copies per reaction, we see a slight uh, decrease with when we're using the pan viral. And again, at the 10 copies per reaction, again, seeing a, a, another slight decrease. This was actually really exciting data for us because we knew these are all actually single reactions. And just from the work that we've been doing with the um, RNA access already, we know if you have enough sample and you can do multiple reactions, you actually can build that coverage up fairly easy by just doing multiple preps. How will we use this actually in the field? So in a uh, really in a, a post Ebola, uh, Liberia, and before Ebola hit, uh, Lhasa was one of the main, um, was the main uh, hemorrhagic fever of interest uh, in the area. And so it's um, endemic within West Africa, but really found in uh, four countries, uh, uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia, and Nigeria. It's different than Ebola, where you have, um, instead of human to human transmission, you have a lot of the virus is maintained in the rodent population. So you have a lot of these uh, kind of uh, individual spillover events. So a outbreak, and outbreaks end up being seasonal. So a, a virus sequence in the same outbreak can actually be up to like 20%, uh, what we've seen really, 15% uh, di divergent at the nucleotide level in the same country. And just overall, uh, so like over 20% divergence between uh, the different lineages. In 2016, there's, uh, there's kind of the, the Lhasa belt in Liberia is up in the uh, north uh, eastern region. So samples from some of the uh, main hospitals that get Lhasa patients send, send their samples to the um, National Reference Lab, who actually sends it out to uh, Kenema in uh, Sierra Leone. However, in 2016, they stopped accepting samples during the Ebola outbreak, so Liberia was left with really uh, no way to uh, diagnose uh, these cases. And uh, for Alasa, it's actually important because it can be, it's treated with ribovirin. So if you're able to identify early enough, start treatment, uh, you actually have an, uh, pretty good patient outcomes. So uh, this, that, that whole, um, uh, process didn't last too long. They eventually did accept samples, but it showed the Ministry of Health that they really needed to start bringing a diagnostic. So what they brought was a uh, real-time PCR that worked great in Sierra Leone and a rapid antigen test, and as you see, saw very differing results from um, a couple of samples. Well, this kind of representing uh, all the samples they've looked, but I'm just going to show you four. What we did was then um, but they, they brought in a additional real-time PCR that was more pan Lhasa, as well as we uh, brought some of the sequencing targeted uh, panels that we worked with. Uh, our, the one Liberian who's actually trained to running the instrument, Lawrence Vicoli. And we're seeing that now um, kind of everything agrees that this was positive. And then when you kind of look at the sequencing data with the, the, real -time PC, the first real-time PCR that was designed against Lineage 4, which uh, the Liberian um, strains are a part of. However, it was uh, lineage for uh, Sierra Leone. So you see a lot of mismatches to why this real-time PCR is not working. And then with the panviral uh, set where they have ambiguous spaces in there, letting that more flexible, able to pick up a lot more of the diversity. So then uh, just fast forward to 2017, still uh, testing that first real-time PCR just to, uh, I guess they really want to know that it was negative all the time. But now using the um, the second RT-PCR, and again, all uh, agreeing uh, with uh, getting uh, positive uh, sequencing results. However, uh, the next time when we went, we actually added in the panviral uh, probe set as well, because uh, all these samples that were coming in are suspected loss of cases, so the people usually tend to be very sick. So we're seeing some of the negative ones pop with, uh, we're able to uh, get yellow fever, uh, hep hepatitis B, and um, herpes 4, which is uh, Epstein-Barr or mono. Um, so this was, uh, 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 kind of an interesting, um, uh, something we kind of just threw, threw in at the end was trying to sequence some of these negatives. Like, the, 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 I guess the, the main uh, thing we were going for was really to uh, first help the National Reference Lab uh, determine what assay to be using, and now with the sequencing data, also be able to now design better uh, diagnostics for Liberia. Uh, with the added thing of uh, when they get these negatives coming in that we can possibly start uh, pulling these samples together and try to find out what's actually circulating, uh, what other viruses are circulating in Liberia. Um, another example is uh, the monkeypox outbreak that occurred uh, in Nigeria and uh, just recently in September 2017. 
Uh, these were the first cases reported since uh, 1978. So one of the main questions was, uh, was this outbreak caused by um, an endemic source or spillover from a uh, recent outbreak in Central Africa? Uh, so you see there's these group in the two clades where you have West Africa and Central Africa. One of the important things about this was that the, the uh, Central African strain is a lot more virulent than the uh, West African. Uh, and what they were doing with the real-time PCR was just saying yes or no whether it was uh, monkeypox. So uh, in collaboration with the Nigerian CDC and the Institute Pasteur uh, in Dakar, which uh, received some of these samples for testing, uh, within two weeks of uh, everyone requesting uh, sequencing, uh, we were able to uh, send probes uh, and actually get results. Because uh, again, we set that lab up kind of uh, probably uh, three months prior to this, we trained them on the, the methods of the protocol. And so what they're able to do is just switch in uh, the different probe set and actually able to uh, enrich monkeypox and indeed show that these were um, most related to the Nigerian strain, uh, inferring that this was probably a, a spillover event and that uh, monkeypox has just been going on undetected for the past 40 years in Nigeria. Uh, so with that, um, hopefully I've convinced you that this is uh, uh, customizable, where we're able to really plug in the probes of interest. Again, our, our interests are more viral, but there's no reason you can't put in bacteria or eukaryotic targets. Um, I think I probably have a different definition of flexible than maybe twist is I actually we like that it can tolerate a lot of mismatches with the example of like Lhasa because a lot of these viruses are highly, uh, are mutating. And if you're stuck with what's on GenBank to design your probes, it's actually nice that you're able to pull out stuff that is 20% uh, um, divergent and still get a full genome. Um, the sensitivity is not as good when you have a high level of divergence between the probes, but the, because it's a hybridization uh, reaction to pull that out, it is a lot more uh, flexible in that sense. Scalable, we have this working on the bench top, as well as we have it automated in our lab on uh, the Cyclone. And deployable, I would say if it can work in Liberia, I, it can work anywhere. So with that, I want to thank you, um, the Palacios Lab at uh, USAMR, which I'm a part of, all the folks from uh, Liberia and Institute Pasteur in Nigeria, and obviously uh, Twist and Illumina and our funders. Thanks.